I did over a thousand films. I won a ton of awards. I made millions of dollars. I thought, well, if I make enough money, I'll feel different. 33 people have died via suicide or overdose. 33 that I know personally. Hey, you guys, Aldo here with PragerU, and I'm really excited for, for this, uh, this episode or this video on my channel. Uh, today we have Joshua Broom that we're gonna have a conversation, and I'm really excited to speak with Joshua because Joshua is an American pastor. Uh, he is a, uh, a Christian, but he is also an ex-porn star. And he has a really unique perspective on the harmful effects of porn. As you guys know, I've been talking about the harmful effects of porn for a long time. And I think Joshua will give us a really unique perspective and insight into this issue and to tell us about his story. So Joshua, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so glad to be here. And um, thank you for the opportunity to share um, just my story and talk about something that is so important in today's culture. So for people who haven't heard your story, tell us a little bit about it. How did you get into pornography and what was your path getting out of it? Yeah, so a uh, long story made somewhat short. Uh, grew up in a small town in South Carolina. And what was unique about my childhood is that um, I grew up without a dad and that's unfortunately normative in today's culture. But um, what was unique was that the dad that I didn't have in my life or in my home was in the small town that I lived in. So I would see the dad that I didn't have. And that caused me to um, really struggle with, well, is there something wrong with me? Is there something that I did? And like most people, um, have a high achiever personality and that personality caused me to believe, okay, well, maybe I need to prove to myself that I'm worth something. And I tried to do that through accomplishments and, uh, started with, you know, trying to be the best student and trying to be the best athlete. And then I started modeling and acting when I was around 13 years old and had some success in that space. Um, went to college, studied theater, and then eventually moved to LA. And um, all the while trying to do enough to feel like I was enough. And um, I was working at um, a restaurant in, um, in, in the middle of West Hollywood. So I was working a job to pay the bills while I was chasing the dream. And um, in that space, three girls walked in and they asked um, if I was interested in acting, but the acting they were talking about was in the pornography industry. And uh, I think it was just so interesting that the language they were using, um, because language is so important, and the language that we're using was, hey, we want you to meet with our agent at you know his office, and then he'll set up an interview with you to talk to you about what it would look like to be um, in the industry. And um, anytime you can normalize something or you know present present something in a counterfeit way that looks as if um, it's not damaging or taboo or any of those things, um, you can more easily. Uh, get someone or you can more easily convince someone to do what you want them to do or manipulate people or coerce people into what you want them to do. And, um, and because I had been exposed to pornography and because I was living a promiscuous way, um, being invited to have this conversation, uh, in my gut, definitely knew it was wrong, but curiosity got the best of me. And I thought, okay, well, at least I'll have a conversation and we'll see what it's like. And I was, you know, I made the decision like, okay, if it's like super sketchy, then I just won't go um, or I won't walk in. But I go to this space and it's in Studio City and it's adjacent to where Universal Studios is. So like, you know, Universal Studios is on your right, and then on your left, you go into this um, business complex, and inside of this business complex is this um, agency. And I walk in, and it's, and it's called, ironically, I was represented by LA Models, and this place was called LA Direct Models. And I go in, and I, you know, check in with the receptionist, and she points me to the agent's office, and he asked me, like, pre he was pretty direct and asked me three questions. He was like, hey, how'd you grow up? What are you doing in LA? And what do you hope to accomplish? 
And I was like, well, grew up just pretty much me and my mom. I'm out here to do acting, and I guess I want to be famous. And in retrospect, if you're someone who was looking for ammunition to manipulate someone, hearing, okay, they're from a broken home. They're, you know, out here pursuing, you know, the, the same thing pretty much everyone, not everyone, but most people are there, you know, to, to step into some kind of industry or to become um, someone in some capacity. And then thirdly, I would say most interestingly enough, I said I want to be famous and um, being famous or being rich, it's such a vague thing. And because it's not measurable, it's truly not tangible because what equates to being famous? Like how many followers do you need before you're famous? Or how many movies do you need to be in before you're famous? Or if you're talking about being rich, like what you know, what, what metric, what number amount equates to you being rich. And I think when you're in pursuit of something that's not really tangible, when you, even if you set a metric and you meet it and it doesn't feel the desire that you thought it would, or it doesn't make you feel the way that you thought it would, you just, you know, set it, uh, set the bar a little higher. Like, well, it, maybe if I did a little more, I'll feel different. And I said I was searching for fame, but what I really wanted is to feel loved, to feel seen, to, to, to be known. And I had lived my life trying to fill the void of not hearing, son, I'm proud of you. And that all led to that moment where I had that conversation with him and he promised me, hey, I'll make you famous. I will, you know, you'll be the guy. You've got acting experience in the pornography industry. It's changing to we're going to parody all these films and you can be the lead in all these movies and you'll be rich, you'll be famous, blah, blah, blah. And he wasn't lying. I, I said yes to doing those things and um, I obtained everything that he promised right out of the gate, it's like when I did that, when I did that first film, I thought, okay, you know, what is this going to cost me? No one's going to find out. It's not going to be a big deal. But even in 2006, the first scene that I did, it went viral and my family found out. And then my agent found out and I had this humiliating conversation with my mom and I got fired from the mainstream agency that was representing me. Can you talk to me about that conversation of your family understanding or was finding out that you were doing this? Because it seems like, you know, even before you said yes, that there was, you know, in the back of your head, even though you were convinced that, you know, in your heart, did you, you it sounds like you felt a, a bit of shame, um, you know, in oh, that sir. you didn't I mean, want people to find I, out or you didn't think they would find out. Yeah, I mean, you, you uh, if you pull up porn in a library uh, and it's on your phone and someone walks by, 100% of people would, would put their phone facing down. Um, if you're watching porn in your bedroom and someone walks in, 100% of people are going to um, cover themselves up or turn off the TV. Um, just the fact that in the porn industry, you go by a pseudonym, um, that in itself, that you relinquish your name where you're searching to make yourself famous. But the first thing you do is you surrender your actual identity to take on another one. I think there's, yeah. it's so multifaceted where it's clear that there's shame associated with that. And, you know, and, and that's, that's, you know, that's ingrained into your nature. You know, I, I you, you don't have to, you know, that there's, there's this like, this really interesting awareness, like as um, you get older, it's like kids go from, you know, not caring that they're running around naked to all of a sudden they don't want to be seen if they're changing. And it's just this awareness and like shame is something that uh, you're, you're born into understanding that there's this level of exposure that is for private. And um, I think like the, the more that you're in tune with that, the more that uh, you operate in that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was clear that th this was not a good thing. Um, and when I did it, you know, after I did the first scene, I, I felt disgusting. <laughs> 
I mean, it. I there was you know camera A, camera B, camera C. There was someone shooting BTS. There was someone like holding a light underneath me. There was, uh, you know, th- this is 2006. So um, some people use like 5Ds or 7Ds, you know, like the handheld Canon cameras. But for the most part, they were still using like the large, you know, cam like the large camera. So there's like literally a, a big camera like over my shoulder because. The interaction and the engagement, like with the girl, it's with the girl in the camera, and it's not with you. So it's 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 so yeah. different than reality because the connection is the girl with the camera, and you're disconnected from everything. And it's your job to you know perform um, in a way that looks um, attractive, but it's it doesn't feel. Good because like you're 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 you know you're opening up for camera angles that um, are unnatural and you're doing things not for you you're doing things for show and it's and it's so different and just the fact you know you go in and you don't have a conversation with the girl like there's no um, you know real intimacy happening you you sign a piece of paper that says that you saw um, their, you know, because you have to have like your work permit is essentially your updated STD and AIDS test. Like you have to have like a, most people re- require like a 21 day test that's, you know, it, it's, it's current up to 21 days. And it's like, you look at her IDs and does it match the name on that test? And you sign that you saw it. And that's at times as much as you know about the person and then you walk into set and you have sex and it sounds like uh, treating, treating human beings like animals almost. It's exactly like that. It's, I mean, there's a, there's, so number one, the, the, the girl is using, um, some kind of, some kind of lubrication at times, numbing cream. Um, the guy is using erectile dysfunction medication. Um, the director is telling them what to do. You're being paid to do it. Um, you're doing it not for each other. You're doing it for show. Um, um, you're, it's definitely like you're a puppet and you're doing an act that looks like a representation of intimacy or engagement, but it's you're actually suppressing reality and becoming a product. And that's the danger of consuming pornography because if you, if you consume pornography, you are consuming a, a person on a screening, treating them as such if they were a product. And if you adje- objectify a person on a screen, the reality that you're consuming that and the mirror neurons that uh, are in your brain, you are wired to desire the thing that you see and then go and seek it out in some capacity. And if you're desiring this act of intimacy that's fictitious and you can't obtain it, you're going to go to great lengths to try to satisfy yourself, but you're going to end up insatiable. And that's why it's so cyclical because you're you're consuming something so that you feel something and it doesn't quite work. And then there's shame associated and it's just this, this cyclical thing. But there's, you know, it, 94% of porn depicts violence. Um, there's uh, one of the most popular types of porn is teen porn, but they, the teen porn has um, people dressed up in stockings and pigtails. So that's not depicting a teen, that's depicting children. So there's so many things that you are consuming and it's creating thought patterns and desires and you have an appetite for something that is so unhealthy. And then you, you have that real appetite in the real world and that violence that you're seeing, you're portraying it on a partner and it in a real way contributes to rape culture in a real way it contributes to the sexual assault that happens that it, the craziest thing that i've heard as i've done a ton of research on this um, around 80 percent of the sexual assaults right sexual abuse that happens to children 12 and under in america 80 percent of the time the perpetrator is 12 and under so what's happening is Kids are watching porn and they're acting it out on their brother or sister. And that's Jeez. happening at an alarming rate. In Australia, it's around 87%. Um, and it's, it's, it's outlandish and sad and so broken. 
I'm in this space, and yeah, I did it, and I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I did it anyway, and that's the way shame works. It's like once I did that, and my mom finds out, and I'm, I have this shame-filled conversation, and I get fired from uh, the career that I was pursuing, it's so easy to believe, well, um, because I did that, now I am that, right? Because I did a bad thing, I am a bad person, and not only do I feel bad, my greatest mistake, the thing that creates shame in my life, in my heart, it's tangibly found on the internet. Now, in a right. real way, it's dictating how I see myself and how I live my life. So the the porn um, agent calls me and say, hey, uh, everything went great. I would love to sign you to a contract and represent you. And while I didn't want to do that, I believed a lie, and that's a dangerous thing about a lie. If you believe a lie to be true, it becomes true to you. And through that lie, you see the world. And through that broken lens, I was ready to live a broken life. And I thought, okay, yeah. well, this is uh, the only thing I can do, which was just not true. I was 22. I, I had a college education. I, there were, there were, I mean, there were other things that I could do. And um, would that one thing have impacted my life in some way? Sure. But in no way was my reality that I could not do anything else other than porn. But I saw that in that moment, well, this, this is the only thing I can do. And yeah. I said, okay. And then same mentality, right? The same mentality that caused me to train really hard to be a good athlete, to be a good student, to be a good communicator, to be a good actor. Um, the same work ethic, the same personality – I just transferred that into the porn industry. It's like, well, um, I'll be the most um, successful person in that industry. And I did. Um, I did over a thousand films. I won a ton of awards. I made millions of dollars. And in my head, I thought, well, if I make enough money, I'll feel different. And but like you I, said, you know, when, when success is intangible and when there's not a metric to, to measure that, uh, people can take advantage of you and use that as a bargaining chip to continue making you and convincing you to do things that you don't want to do. And what I found was really interesting about what you said was the language surrounding the porn industry. And I think it's the same thing that the left does with language regarding anything, which is they, they teach you out of things that you already know, oh, right? Sure. They it call is. things like OnlyFans or pornography. They call it sex work well, instead yeah, of calling it, it prostitution because the shame that yeah. we all have, you know, you talked about it. It's natural in us. If we have porn on our phones or whatever it is, we feel shame just naturally. And they co-opt language and they change language to make us unlearn our natural feelings or our natural tendencies. And I think that's that's really interesting, you know, when you talk about the language that they used to convince you, because you naturally felt shame. You naturally uh, felt like this maybe wasn't the best thing that you should be doing. Um, but through co-opting language, they were able to convince you of, of, of a lie. Yeah, I mean, certainly. And then and I think, like, if you believe that your life doesn't have any value outside of selling yourself for sex, um, and just the way that the porn industry kind of manipulates and shapes people where if you believe that the only yes that has any validity is you saying yes to selling yourself for sex, um, your no loses its validity at all because you feel like you can't say no to anything because that's the only thing that you can say yes to because that's the only value in which you have. And there's girls that come in the industry that say um, they have a no list, right? There's things that they don't want to do. And what happens is they get in the industry and they stay in the industry for a while and the thing that they didn't do, it becomes tabby. Taboo, and there's a demand for people to see the person do the thing that they don't want to do because the porn industry is built around a narrative where no doesn't mean no. It means not yet or how much. And um, these girls will – their, their agent will come to them and say, well, um, I know you said that you didn't want to do that, but you're not working as much as you were a few months ago. And there's a studio that came to me and they said that you'll do, they'll give you $50,000 if you do the thing that you said you didn't want to do. And then they, they convince, they, they can, you know, the agent convinces the person to do it and then they do it. And now it becomes normative. And now the thing that you said you didn't want to do is now just something that you do on a regular basis. And that, you know, that runs its course. 
then all of a sudden, you know, there, there's nothing that you haven't done. So there's nothing for you to say no to, and there's nothing for you to say yes to. And, um, you, you end up in a, a really dark place. Um, 33 people that I knew personally. So I've been out of the porn industry for 11 years and 33 people that I know personally that I know their real names. I've, you know, ate food with them. I've spent time with them. I know where they're from. I know these people. Um, 33 people have died via suicide or overdose. 33 that I know personally. That's and tragic. And 500 people have died over the last 20 years, suicide, overdose, or murder. 500 people. So how, how were you able to, to stop yourself from being one of those? How, how did you not become a statistic? How did you find your way out when you're talking about all these things, not being able to say no, uh, feeling like that was your only option? How did you possibly get out of this? Yeah, so it was so interesting. So it, it was almost like at the the precipice of my career, at the pinnacle of my career, um, in 2012, I won Performer of the Year. And I thought, well, if I won that award, that meant that, you know, the, the industry, the studios, and the, the people um, that have a say would have voted that I was the best. And I thought if I heard that I was the best, I would feel like I was worth something. And I won it, and it didn't work. And the anxiety that I already had was amplified. The depression that I already had was deepened. And um, soon after that, I started wrestling with, well, um, if, if I've achieved everything that I thought would make me happy and none of it has worked and I have destroyed my life, I've now done a thousand pornographic films that are partitioned into hundreds of thousands of pieces of content that are going to be on the internet forever. I've ruined my life. I have no hope. I'll never be a father. I'll never be a husband. I'll never contribute to the world that leads to positive change. And I, and I wrote these things on a piece of paper and I said, this is the reason, these are the reasons I want to die. And I made a plan to take my life. And on this day, I, um, I, I had set up everything I needed to do to harm myself to the extent where I no longer was going to be alive. And um, that day, um, I had flown back from Atlanta. I landed, to, um, I landed at, uh, at uh, LAX, and I went back to my place in Sherman Oaks, and that's where I set that up. When, and um, I had this check in my pocket, and I was just like, it was just driving me crazy. And I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to go deposit this because I can't let what I did and the money that I got for it, uh, at least if I put it in my account, like someone will get it. And um, I go to the bank, and then normally I would do like Dropbox, ATM, mobile deposit. But on this day, I wanted to give that check to a person so that they would justify and affirm the way that I saw myself. Because on the memo of the check, they would always write something grotesque. They would write the title or the action or something where it was clear that you were being compensated for a sexual act. And it was almost like this antagonistic thing to, you know, demean you further um, but I wanted a person to agree with me that I was disgusting, that I was worthless. And, um, I walked into the bank and I slid the check across the counter and I waited on her to say the thing that I believed to be true about myself. She did the deposit as normal, didn't say anything, um, kept looking at the check. And then right before I was about to go, after she handed them rece the receipt, she said, Joshua, are you okay? Joshua, can I help you? And it wasn't a like it wasn't customer service language. It, the, the transaction was over, and she saw this young man that was shaking and sweating and scared. And she looked at me and asked me if I was okay. And what was so you know unique about her saying my name and so important about her saying my name is I hadn't heard my name in over a year. Because oh I removed myself from everyone that was saying, hey, I love you. What are you doing with your life? 
Why are you doing this? You're so much better than this. You, you have so much more to offer than this. Please stop doing this. And the way, you know, accountability and, and good friends work, if, if I say to you, hey, uh, you're doing something that's harmful to your life, why are you doing this? Like, please stop. You can either say, hey, you're right, I need to make some changes, or you can re- remove me from your life. And that's what I did. I, all of my friends, all of my fran- all of my family, and even my mom, where she continued texting and calling me, I convinced myself that it was better for her that I removed myself from her because how could how could I contribute to my mom as a son living the way that I was living? So I just removed myself from everyone. So now a year, like Joshua Broom didn't exist. I was just this, like my barber, the people at the gym, the people at the studio, like everyone called me by this stage name. And in that bank, she said my name and it like snapped me out of it. And I felt the guilt of not letting my mom know if I was okay because people were dying all over the place. So her concern was valid if I was okay. And then I call, I, I left and I called my mom and uh, there were lots of tears and snot and whatnot. And I left that industry. I quit that industry that day and I moved to North Carolina um, to where my mom, uh, around the area that my mom was, you know, I, I removed myself from doing those things. I removed myself from that industry. I removed myself from the people that were toxic in my life. But what I carried with me was the wounds in which, you know, that, that life has caused. But I tried to pretend as if nothing had happened and I was okay. And I was, I was walking, I'm walking wounded and pretending I was okay when I wasn't. And I started working at a gym same same mentality, right? So we'll start working in a gym. I'm going to be the best best trainer. I'm going to get all the accreditations. I'm going to get, you know, all this training. I'm going to become the best. I'm going to have the most clients. I'm going to get shredded. I'm going to do all this stuff so that um, I manage the perception of others and I put enough good dirt on my bad dirt so I don't feel dirty or look dirty. You know, I want to do enough good things so I don't feel bad about the bad things. And really, not even, you know, it, it was more of I'm trying to do enough good things so I look like I'm a good person. I looked like I had my life together. I looked like I was doing something good now. And I was. But I was still broken and hurting inside, and there was only um, a short season of where I felt as if I was okay mentally, and then my mental health got really bad again. And around that time, I met this this girl, and I met this girl uh, at the gym. I asked her out a bunch of times, and she said no a bunch of times, and she finally agreed to go on a run with me. And when we met to um, go on that run, I was like, hey, um, you know, I, I, I just feel guilty. I was like, I'm just going to tell her, like, my past, how bad I am. And then that way, like, I'm not going to get hurt because she's just going to ditch me when she finds out. And then uh, she's not going to have to deal with the pain of, like, finding out she's, you know, like, falling for someone that, ha- that that has a past like me. So I'm just going to like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be up front and deal with the consequences. And I was like, hey, before we start this walk, like, I need to tell you something. And I ultimately did like a five minute monologue of, hey, this is how bad I am. And she asked me, hey, are you are you doing that stuff right now? Like, are you still doing these things? And I was like, no, it's been about two years since I left that industry and I haven't done anything like that since. And her response was after that, she was quiet for a little bit. And then she looked at me and she said, well, a person is not defined by the worst thing they've ever done. And a person is not defined by the greatest thing they'll ever do. There's a creator God that exists outside of time, space, and matter. And he has the final say. He determines who you are. Do you know him? And um, I had spent so much time, you know, uh, I call it like the first date mask, right? Where um, I don't know who I am and I don't think I have any value. So I just pretend to be whoever the person across from me wants me to be, or I think they want me to be so they like me. So I was just like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I know, I know God, I'm a Christian. Sure. 
and she, she found me out pretty quick, and she shared that she had been following Jesus since she was in the seventh grade, and she had a strong relationship with him, and her faith was an important part of her life, and she said that she wasn't perfect by any means, but her relationship with Jesus was the foundation in which she lives her life. And then she asked me what kind of food <laughs> that I like. And she asked me about my long-term and short-term goals. She asked me about my family. She asked me about my hopes, my dreams, things I was scared of. And all of a sudden, I was just so perplexed by this. She confronted the thing that I thought most true, that I was it was most true about me. I thought um, I was unwanted because of the way that my family dynamic was when I was a kid. And I thought I was a bad person because of the decisions I made in the life that I lived. And she was like, no, those things might be true about you. And those things might impact the way that you see yourself and the, the, the way that you live your life. But at your core, that's not who you are. Yeah. We walked and talked and um, she invited me to church and in that church, I heard the, the full and true gospel that, um, you know, Romans 3.23, that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And uh, Romans 6.23, the wages of that sin is death. And that Jesus came, uh, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose again on the third day. And if I turn from my sins and I put my faith in Jesus Christ, then his perfection is bestowed upon me, and I could be forgiven for every sin that I've ever committed. And I, I made that decision, and it changed my life. And in that moment, I was just overcome with His love. That's and incredible. The girl that went on that, the girl that I went on that walk with, her name is Hope, and um, she's been my wife for almost eight years, and we have four kids. And three days wow. after, uh, three days after I gave my life to Christ, I, I go to this church and I'm like, "Hey, uh, I want to learn how to read the Bible because I feel like I have a story to share, but it's not mine; it's God's story, and I need to be able to tell His meta narrative of what His overarching story and how my life plays into that." I got poured into by um, some church leaders in that church there for a few years. And then I went to Liberty University and studied Christian ministries and um, just sought after knowing the person of Jesus through, um, through prayer, through reading his word, through spending time with him and spending time with God's people. And so Jesus saved my life, but the, the word of God changed my life as I become to love it, um, to know it and apply it to my life. Because, um, yeah, I wrote a book called seven lies that'll ruin your life. And it's really about, Hey, there's lies that I believe to be true. And when I experience the person that encompasses truth, which is Jesus, it can, conf it conflicted in that, um, lies, are dismantled and destroyed when they interact with truth. And I rebuilt a new identity, a new foundation in the man that I am today and the way that I live my life. It's not dependent on how I feel or what I think. It's his word. Something I noticed while listening to your story, and I've noticed listening to a lot of people's story, is that their earthly relationships are such a strong predictor of their relationships with their heavenly, their heavenly father or uh, otherwise, you know, if, if it's, if you don't have a relationship with your earthly father, I, I find it much more difficult for those people to have a relationship with their heavenly father. Right. You know, and hearing you, or I was reading up about your story before we had this conversation, but again, hearing that you grew up without a father and that's growing up without being able to see what a loving relationship looks like between a man and a woman. Yeah. Being able as a kid to see what does affection look like? What does forgiveness look like? What does it look yeah. like for a man to treat a woman properly and a woman to treat a man properly? And in all the stories I've heard of young men or anyone growing up without a father, that relationship and, you know, between those two people in love and forgiveness is completely gone. And of course, when you don't have that, you grow up with, you know, problems feeling validated or feeling like you can forgive yourself or forgive others or feeling like you're deserving of love. Uh, and I, I've seen that, that trend in, in a lot of ways. I recently uh, came out with a documentary called Masculinity in America, and that was a big theme in it is men growing up 
without seeing those relationships. The, in the same way that it transcends, well, you not understanding like virtue or, you know, understanding chastity in a way like you don't understand it because you've never seen it. I think um, it impacts your life. It even transcends uh, even more like how you treat women, but like you don't even understand how to be a friend because yeah. – um, like even in this world, it's like we live in the most connected generation in the history of time while simultaneously being the most disconnected, you know, generation in the history of time. And I think the, the proclivity and the, you know, how prevalent pornography is in our culture, it leads us to disengaging people. And we are, you know, we live in this shame cycle and we see people as products, so uh, I'm not going to have integrity. I'm not going to value our friendship. I'm going to see, well, uh, I'm, I'm training my mind to extract value from people, so yeah. I don't value you as a person. And if I don't value you as a person, you know, the, the talk that I gave uh, this past weekend, just the correlation between pornography and the abortion industry, well, if I see people as products and I see sex as transactional, the byproduct of that meaningless interaction is of course going to be an inconvenience to my life that doesn't matter when in reality that's a human being but it's so easy for me to disassociate myself from reality because I've objectified people to the extent where I don't care and if you look at the biblical narrative every time there was a rise in sexual immorality what was hand in hand going on at the same time was child sacrifice because every time God creates something Satan wants to counterfeit it and in the same way Jesus died for you to have access to the Father, we believe um, wrongly, people can believe that, well, if I sacrifice this child for me, I'll have access to more. And it's, it's this dangerous belief. And I think that pornography at its core and really intimacy at its core, that's why there's so many broken aspects of identity. It's like, that's, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with an identity crisis in this world and the byproduct of the, the gender dysphoria and pornography and um, divorce and, and everything else is a byproduct of not knowing at your core, who am I? Yeah. Everything becomes self-serving, you know, and even when you think about contraceptives, it reduces the spiritual bonding between two people. It reduces sex to essentially masturbation, right? It's, it's all, it all becomes self-serving. Um, we got to wrap up here soon, but before we wrap up, I want to ask you about something that's been going on recently with this popular OnlyFans girl named Nala, the, the yeah. ninja she goes by. She recently gave her life to Christ, um, but some people are questioning whether or not she's authentic. Here's her quick testimony, uh, and then I want to get your thoughts on it. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so really quick, I have a couple things to address, and I just need you to listen to me. So I've had quite a few people reach out to me, comment, you know, just truly curious about what and why I changed. So, so listen, I was a pastor's kid for almost all my life. I grew up in church. I was always in church. You know, I was also homeschooled. So my life truly felt like a cage. And I'm not saying Christianity is a cage. I'm saying religion was the cage. I was a Baptist, you know, I was a Baptist pastor's child for the longest time, right? Me and my family did not have a good relationship. And I'm the middle of five children. So I'm talking about my other brothers and sisters and my parents. It just truly felt like such a cage. I was a very rebellious child, like sneaking out when I was like 16 years old. I was like, I was just going the wrong way, right? So about four years ago, I started my OnlyFans because I think truly it was out of pure rebellion. And tr and like, honestly, I'm such a like independent person that I never felt the need for a man to provide for me, like have a man in my life to provide for me. Um, so I started OnlyFans about four years ago and I climbed to top 0.01%. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that the devil can truly give you things in this life. He has a budget though. So yeah. She's given yeah. her life to Christ. She's talked a lot about it. But now you have people that are saying she's full of crap. She's only doing this to get Christian men to sign up for her OnlyFans. She's maybe not authentic because the change was so quick. And how I look at it is that 
I, I think it's okay to be skeptical and it's okay to have doubts, but for her sake, I have to hope that she is being authentic. And I, ha and I think the message needs to be that true redemption is possible. Uh, and if we don't have that message, if we're just saying, well, you know what? Her past is her past. She'll never be able to run from it. She'll never be able to be uh, saved. Then that's going to alienate other people that might be thinking of leaving in the same right. And, you know, I don't think that's mutually exclusive with the fact that, hey, yes, she is saved, but the baggage and the sins of her past will will always uh, or I guess she'll she'll still have to deal with the baggage of, of the sins of her past. Um, but I think we do need to send the message that re that true change is possible. What do you think? Yeah, um, I, there's there's few things that I would be more passionate about. Um, First and foremost, you know, just hearing her story, um, hearing the this it, it's, you know, almost this cognitive dissidence where she's there. She's hearing um, a biblical narrative and there were seeds that were planted in her life. But there was this disconnectedness to, um, OK, if I'm looking to my father to be a representation of what I see the church to be and maybe um, a, a, a connectivity to what I believe following Jesus looks like or what the church is supposed to be like. That's why it's so important that we have a, an independent dependency on the person of Jesus. And if I'm dependent on a human broken person, I'm going to end up being disappointed because people will let you down. John 1633 talks about, I, I've told you all these things so that in me, you can have peace. Jesus speaking, uh, in this world, you will face tribulation, um, but you can take heart because I have overcome the world. So peace and courage come from the person of Jesus. Jesus, but he promises tribulation. So there's, if you put your faith in people or functions, you're going to be disappointed because they're ran by imperfect people. The only perfect person is Jesus. So it's, it's so important to know that. And then I think, okay, so she's she's got this disconnectedness of maybe her dad wasn't there in the way that she needed him. So she she acted out so that she would receive the thing that she had uh, a right desire for, but she she responded to that emotion in a wrong way. But I would just say, of course, she can be redeemed. Um, of course she can. I mean, if you look at the Bible, look at Moses killed someone. David uh, cheated on, uh, you know, his wife and he had uh, the, the husband of the person he got pregnant killed to cover it up. Um, and you're, this is the ma a man after God's own heart. Peter lied uh, to Jesus's face. He denied him three times. Um, Saul was a persecutor of the church and he wrote 66% of the New Testament. So can people change their life? And are there biblical examples of people being redeemed and transformed? Most certainly. Um, you, but you look at the fruit of someone's life and gosh, like, is she going to get it right um, right now? Is she going to do everything perfectly? No. Um, she just came out of a lot of brokenness. And I think it's so hypocritical for people to say, well, um, she's just doing this for cloud or she's just doing this for that. Gosh, um, you, uh, you know, the, the person listening, if you are in a relationship with Jesus up until the moment that you were, you were dead. You were dead and you were on your way to hell. You were dead. So if, 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 if we all have the same starting block, so like Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and, and it falls short of God's perfect standard. Romans 6.23, we, because of our sins, we face a death. The wages of sin is death. So we're all guilty and we're all equally dead. We're all equally guilty. We're all equally dead. And because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, his perfection, that is the only way that anyone is forgiven. The only way anyone goes to heaven. That is the only way. He's the truth, the way, yeah. and the life. Like he is the only way to the Father. So we all are in need of saving and Jesus' blood is more than sufficient enough for OnlyFans, for murder, for whatever it might be, fill in the blank. He is more than enough. And for us to judge people that came out of brokenness, that have found life, that have found redemption. And as she's celebrating, like the joy on her face when she got baptized, like, holy moly, man, like yeah. I've been there. Like the day that I came out of that water and I 
didn't realize I experienced, like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, talking about you're a new creation. All of a sudden you taste something that you thought was impossible. You have hope. Yeah. And that's what the gospel offers, hope. And to anyone that is doubting the capability of Jesus, you might not know who Jesus actually is. And my prayer for her is that she doesn't just give some of her life, that she gives all of her life. And what you'll see, like you, I heard her say something that I talk about, like anyone that's in sin, that is, is doing the work of Satan, that is excelling in an incredible way, man, give those gifts, those talents, that personality, Put it in submission and surrender to the person of Jesus and watch because what he will do is he will do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever hope or imagine because that is who he is because there is nothing that Jesus is not Lord over. So I'll just say, yeah, like, can she be redeemed? Most certainly, yes. And if she stumbles along the way and makes a a decision that's imperfect, there's just a microscope on our life. Is anyone perfect? No, no one is. Um, But gosh, I I hope the best for her. And and that's just what is true. Me too. Well, hey, listen, I, uh, we got to wrap it up here, but I'll be praying for her. And after listening to your story, Josh, I just, I want to thank you again for being here and telling it because I, I know that a lot of people out there, can relate to it, can get something very powerful and important out of your story. And I, I would really love to have you back because I really enjoyed this. And just thank you so much for, for sharing your story again, man. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that I want to know people, people to know most is like, regardless of where you've been or what's happened or what is, even in what's happened to you, um, there is freedom available to you and there's a life worth living. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, If you've made it this far, be sure to like this video and subscribe. Uh, Turn on the notification bell so you guys know the next time we'll be posting. Check out everything Josh is doing. Uh, You can find his social medias in the detailed description below. And uh, hopefully Josh will have you back sometime soon. Sounds great. Thanks so much, guys.